everyone. By now, many of you have seen the film Oppenheimer, which was a critically acclaimed film. I mean, really well done and really well documenting a very intense piece of history that was perhaps one of humanity's real low points. And what I'm going to share with you today is the rest of the story, what happened after this. And it has to do with a letter that Albert Einstein and Oppenheimer wrote to President Truman. So first, just setting the stage, as you know, um, through the work of Paula Harris and Jacques Vallée, the explosion at Trinity prior to dropping the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was a very very well documented um, event in terms of our the hydrogen bomb and our beginning of nuclear and the nuclear uh, weaponry age. Oppenheimer was very conflicted about having done this, and this does show in the movie, but it doesn't really show much after the fact. And you'll see a very famous plaque that is at the ground at the site where Trinity was first uh, detonated. And it says in there, and this is, was a famous part in the movie too, if you haven't seen the film, it's definitely worth seeing, Oppenheimer is a very complex character. And essentially, it was from the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So just to understand where he was coming from, and Albert Einstein, as a close friend of his, collaborated a couple years after World War II to see what was going to happen next because we had now drawn the attention of extraterrestrial civilizations, which they were fully aware of. So first of all, I want to back up. And, and the, the thing that was really um, bothering Oppenheimer is that the bomb was the reason we started gaining so much surveillance from ET species. Now, I can say just from my own knowledge, and you can say from some of your own knowledge, and we've I've interviewed so many people, but uh, almost 40 years ago, the group of guides that I work with told me that you're going to find UFOs mostly near uh, military installations. They're greatly interested and concerned with what we're going to do next. And they even used some strong language at the time saying, uh, it's really not not going to be allowed that we shoot this stuff into space because it does disturb the entire field. Now, Oppenheimer was aware of what he had unleashed, what the U.S. government had unleashed that he and his team had created. So the question then becomes, if he's responsible for bringing all this ET surveillance to our planet, and we know about this through crashes and through sightings and thousands and thousands of videos now that we don't even need to debate this anymore. We're being visited. We've Not only are we being visited, they've probably always been here. We may be them for all we know. Okay. So let's go back to that time. You had another character named George Adamski, who you've heard me talk about before. And Paula and I have done stories on this. And his case is particularly interesting because he met with a being that would come in a bell-shaped craft named Orthon, who was very concerned about military events and about what was going to happen prior to the detonation of this bomb. And Adamski's story has been well documented, and it's only a matter of whether you really care to believe him. Uh, there are photographs, and the photographs have been enhanced where you can actually see the craft itself, and I can show you a couple of those here. Um, some people, I, I'm not really sure why, are disparaging of Adamski's work. I personally um, have, through reading his book, found him to be very intelligent and reflective and quite a gentleman. Um, he was not a loud type of character that was trying to gain attention for himself. So let's assume that his visitations were real. They had very deep concerns with what humanity was about to do militarily, among many other things. And so... Now we get to the day of the detonation. First of all, to set the backdrop a bit, it's wonderful if you could read Trinity, the book by Paula and Jacques Vallée. In it explains the kind of the background, the historic background of the place, the people, the indigenous and native population that was living there who had already encountered crashes and been able to pick up some of the debris. The story of the Trinity crash is absolutely fascinating. Now, it's important to know that the Trinity crash was only a few miles when, for, from the area, um, the housing that Oppenheimer and the others were staying in. 
And so if you can imagine these little kids who were part Native, part Mexican, who were ranchers, part of rancher families on the land, they'd come and go from the cafe um, that Oppenheimer and all of his colleagues would dine at during the development of the bomb. And he, they, he would talk about how these men would come in in suits with their briefcases out in the middle of the desert. And uh, nobody paid attention to these little kids. You know, they, they were just kids. But what happened is, and this has been brought up since the film came out, and certainly before, I believe there may be, may be uh, an ongoing lawsuit right now, that the government never even told the local population what was going on. And you see some of these absurd scenes in the film where they were so close to the blast, they were simply putting sunglasses on and putting like grease paint on their faces because they didn't know the effects of what nuclear energy was going to do, an explosion of nuclear energy. It's really quite naive. When you watch the film, you think, oh my God, that's what they, that's how they tried to protect themselves. Well, they didn't protect the native population at all who lived right there. Uh, when the bomb went off, uh, some of the main people that you'll see uh, featured in Paula and Jock's book, Trinity, um, had severe repercussions. Uh, one of the boys, one of the main witnesses uh, was deafened. His mother went blind. Um, many of them developed a much larger than normal percentage of the people in their little community developed leukemia afterward. And they were just considered collateral damage, not worth even warning before the bomb went off. So that's kind of the backdrop of what was going on. Just incredible ignorance on the part of the people involved and a lack, total lack of care um, for those around them. I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. What happened, I'm going to show you a photo here that Paula passed on to me that's quite interesting. And let me take a look at my notes here. This name, the name of this particular uh, camera is called a Rapatronic camera. It was built by Dr. Harold Edgerton and he was photographing nuclear explosions. Um, and the nice thing about it was, or the interesting thing is he was able to photograph right down to the origin, the original milliseconds of the blast and get these incredible images through this very sophisticated type of camera that he had developed for this purpose in the 1940s. So there was a, a particular set of cameras that were set up to capture the explosion and on one of the frames only this particular picture showed up now that's interesting if you look at what was there earlier when Adamski was meeting with these beings who were concerned um, this bell-shaped craft this is a bell-shaped image now when I first saw it I thought well there's a rock like that in Sedona Arizona it's called Bell Rock but the reality is that you can see the Joshua trees here um, and there isn't any formation. There's no natural formation that looks like that that should have been in that. So it looks like it could be, and there are thoughts that far in the foreground, this particular one of those cameras captured this craft who may have just blinked in and blinked out, and it's rather distorted because of the energy that was being given off from the blast. It's interesting to note that the, they were there before, that these um, crafts were there before. Debris had been collected at the Trinity crash, as is documented in Paula and Jacques's book, Trinity. Um, the locals knew well about it. They took this thing, they took the whatever they could find at the crash site home as souvenirs. They thought of them as souvenirs, which set off quite a firestorm of activity among the intelligence community. It's a fascinating story. Nonetheless, they were there and they were watching as this was being developed. So here we have the actual detonation date and we have this anomalous bell-shaped image. So we won't assume too much. Um, the thought is it may well be a craft from those people in the foreground, as I just said. This takes us to after the explosion. We know the rest of the history on that one. And we know that Oppenheimer, he appeared to be in a type of depression after the explosion happened into what he 
uh, and his team had unleashed on the planet. So he and Einstein apparently were both deeply concerned. And so they wrote a letter in 19, June of 1947. I have a copy of the letter here. Now, the uh, eminent uh, UFO researcher and archivist Bob Wood has had this letter, which came through an older, much older gentleman in the military, uh, documented uh, through a number of sources, and it is thought to be real. Okay. And what it said here, a couple of things, is they were writing to the president to basically petition the governments of the world through some organization such as the United Nations to come to United Nations to come together and create a new type of organization that had to do with law. They wanted to call it something like law among planetary peoples. And so they had some tenets in this that had to be considered, uh, not just technological, but really more critically cultural and political, having to do with the variant between other celestial civilizations visiting here and their political and cultural structures and ours. And I'm going to read a couple of the high points. It's You can get the letter yourself. And uh, it's, uh, I think, five or six pages long. I've just taken a few bits out of here that intrigued me in particular. And it said here, if the visitors had advanced culture and a perfect political system, that they would or should have sovereign rights on earth to live among us. It said, if they consider our planet to be void of political unity, they would have the right to colonize, but not to colonize along the classic lines. Now that's left open a little bit, but the next couple of points kind of feed into this. They would offer a kind of tutelage through approval of a kind of United Nations body. In other words, they would come in and help us understand the ramifications of some of what we're doing here and use cleaner, better technologies, have better political structures and so forth. That's that's what they're looking at here. And they felt that the most feasible solution would be to, quote, submit an agreement providing for the peaceful absorption of a celestial race into our culture with the guarantee that their presence would not be revealed. So clearly they're looking at humanoid cultures they were fully aware of that were visiting Earth. You have to remember that Oppenheimer had a very high degree of clearance. I don't know what Einstein's clearance was or if he had clearance, but they were, you can see even in the film, they were connected and had philosophical conversations about what Oppenheimer was working on um, throughout this period of time where the bomb was being developed. So I found that interesting to submit an agreement providing for the peaceful absorption of a celestial race into our culture with the guarantee that they would not be revealed to us. So they would walk among us. Now, um, I've done interviews on this subject before. There are many, many races walking among us. We would probably be absolutely shocked, hopefully not go into too much fear, but shocked to know the number of different ET spaces ET races that are walking among us and that are working at high levels of our government. And I want to say this is highly politically charged. Uh, I don't want to confuse this with the notion that there are species that have been interfering with the human race for thousands of years. I think every one of us has been uh, indoctrinated into that thought. And honestly, there I think there's a good amount of truth to it. There's enough evidence for that. Going back to biblical times, um, I've done some interviews there, Paul Wallace and uh, Sean O'Leara. And so we have to assume, yes, we've had control structures here for a long time from beings that were not do not particularly have our best interest at heart. But wherever there is that, there is also the countervailing species that come who do wish to be of help because we're such an, um, a unique population. Humans are so unique. In fact, I just want to share this one thing with you. Um, Lee Harris and I have done a joint project together with Aziz. And one of the things that came out of it, they said uh, on a few occasions, was that the humans are such a spectacular species. Because the Holy Grail is when we learn to develop wisdom, when we learn to develop care for one another, and start collaborating with this beautiful, intelligent planet we live on, with care for the planet, the, care, the planet's already caring for us. When we can learn to just be wise and mature and live in harmony, and this drops down into our hearts as the way the mind actually works, 
this will be the Holy Grail, a dense species with a physical dense body that is able to demonstrate the attributes of love, harmony, and sustainability. And they said, this is this is it. Many, many, many species are watching us for that alone. Well, needless to say, when that bomb went off and when we've done other such experiments, this is of great concern to those other species because we're not living in our wisdom and we're causing harm to the planet and we're causing harm to the people and the other living species on the planet. So, It appears that Oppenheimer and Einstein were fully aware of this. So they were making what they thought was a perfectly logical five-page, well-thought-out proposal to the president to say, we did this. We're clearly not acting in the highest a species can act in. We could use some guidance, even in our political structures. How about we just start planning for the day when these beings are going to be among us and invite them in and accept their tutelage where needed? So... This is interesting. Of course, um, Marshall, General Marshall stepped in and he, he, he got the letter and he advised that that not be delivered to President Truman because what would it do? It would inf- interfere with the profits of the military industrial complex. They would be losing, if we did something this rational, if we actually invited intelligence in and worked in collaboration with it, their jobs would more or less be done. So, The letter was never delivered to President Truman. Nothing happened except that the military industrial complex became stronger and stronger. And we see what it's done today. It's bankrupting the governments of the world that participate in it. And now we're at a point where we're finally starting to do these kind of little faux revelations of UFOs through these various projects. Better than nothing, we already know that. We already know other cultures exist and they're visiting here. But, you know, New York Times and some of these these organizations are starting to work it with the hand of the government to slowly let the people know this has been going on. And, of course, it's been going on all along. So it gets us to the question, what would have happened? What do you think that scenario would have been like had President Truman seen this letter? We know that we were warned by the next president, Eisenhower, we were warned about the military industrial complex and the harm it was going to do and the fear that was going to be created around the planet, which is another thing they stated is that one of the biggest problems now is that the, all of the governments and militaries of the world would be on edge, uh, suspecting ETs, suspecting each other and go into great patterns of fear and that would cause them to start ramping up in an arms race, which is exactly what happened. So what would happen had Truman read that letter? Don't know. Um, It didn't go that way. And we can still see the exact same forces have control that had control then and are happily reaping the profits off of our backs at our expense when governments are already struggling just to keep basic needs of the people met. Billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars going out to keep trying to protect us from each other. So, you know, Maybe it wasn't such a bad idea to invent a new council and invite some of the more intelligent, spiritually evolved other species in to chat with us and and teach us a thing or two. So I'm just going to leave that question with you. What do you think would have happened? Certainly, it seems we've proven to be too immature that we could even work with another species. We can't even work with each other. So even if even if they had had their wish come true and a council had been created, uh, we're not there yet. But you know what? We are going to be there. Uh, this isn't the end of the story. We are going to be there. But until then, we're going to have a massive amount of attention from species around the cosmos, watching our development, waiting for this thing, this wisdom to kick in. And meanwhile, the ones who've been controlling us are having absolute fits because it is beginning to happen. So we we'll pat ourselves on the back for that one. Um, we will do our part to create from the ground up a wiser and more just world. That's all we can personally do. And don't participate in the games that are keeping the same disruptive forces in control around the world. Doesn't matter what country we're in. We can already see the rise of fascism everywhere, et cetera. So yeah, we don't need to be part of that. We don't need to buy into it. We need to help each other, come together, help each other, exert our wisdom, love one another in the truest sense of the word, be open-hearted and compassionate to one another and let our intelligence start sinking down into our heart where it will emanate with an even deeper wisdom than what our mind can come up with. 
So I hope you found this interesting. Thank you for joining me here on ReginaMeredith.com. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you might also want to consider joining Patreon, which allows me to keep all of this content free and available to everyone. And if you're looking for like-minded souls, you might also enjoy my online community called Our Neighborhood. Links to join are in the description.